Er hat mehr nur Jotial. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. In a mana, in a real, er a rakatirama, tena koto, tena koto, tena ro kato, katoa. Um, uh, tene te raru, e te maru, o kamana whenua, uh, ka te mamoi, waitaha, kaitahu, uh, no mai, haramai, toti mai. I stand here under the umbrella of the people of this place, ka te mamoi, waitaha, tai, kaitahu, uh, and welcome you all here. Ke te whare, uh, tu nei, uh, tēnā koe, uh, tu tonu, tu tonu. To the house that stands here, um, greetings, and may you stand forever. But in the case that we are uncertain about that, um, please, uh, and if there is an emergency that requires us to exit, take the exits to either side and assemble outside the building, or if there's an earthquake, drop cover and hold. In mate hairi hairi hoki atura ki te pō. Um, let us pause to reflect those that have lost, that have been lost, and in particular at the university, um, may we reflect on the loss of a dear friend and senior colleague, uh, Dr. Tasalita Tevali, Director of the Office of Pacific Development, who passed away recently. Uh, ko Waiau, ko Richard Blake i taka wingua, he uh, ko um, Kotorani te iwi, he kaimahia hatawharewaranga o o tako, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Richard Blakey, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise, and it's my great privilege to be your host tonight for this inaugural professorial lecture. Um, I will do some more greetings and then I'll just, uh, my role is to tell you what this is all about and let uh, the other important people uh, get on with proceedings. Um, uh, ki te rangatira, uh, tēnā koutou, there's many important people to acknowledge, uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Royden Somerville, the former Chancellor, uh, tēnā koe. Uh, ki te uh, rangatira, uh, ehoraki, uh, Professors Griffith and Palmer, uh, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law, celebrating its beautiful 150th year this year, and uh, Jess Palmer, uh, the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for uh, Humanities, greetings to you both. Uh, and of course, uh, to our, um, oh no, sorry, Anita, Anita, greetings to our, our special guest who's going to be making some remarks, Anita, Anita Chan, so welcome to you. And we need to especially acknowledge uh, Nikki Taylor, Professor Nikki Taylor, who is our inaugural professorial uh, candidate that we're, uh, that we're celebrating tonight. Uh, we're getting her to sing for her supper, uh, and we're looking very forward very much to that. You've got some special guests, not in the audience as I understand, but online uh, with your husband Mike, children Lloyd, Alex and Victoria, all around the world. Um, I'm very jealous one is about to embark on a cycling trip from Barcelona to Greece and so uh, may you uh, set off on your journey with good spirits hearing your mother uh, give her inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, kite, um, uh, Manuhiri uh, o Tupoti uh, te waipaunamu e um, Aotearoa e te hoe fa uh, no mai hara wa my welcome to those visitors to the University of Otago from here, uh, other places around Aotearoa or from the Four Winds. Greetings to you. This is a public event and a public celebration of promotion to Professor Nikki Taylor. Kete uh, um, kaimahi te farawananga o Otago tēnā koutou katoa and to fellow staff and any students that are here from the University of Otago as well, welcome. I bring with me uh, greetings from our Acting Vice-Chancellor, Professor Helen Nicholson, and in fact also from our former Pro Vice-Chancellor from Humanities, uh, Tony Ballantyne, who are both disappointed that for uh, technical reasons and uh, administrative reasons that they are not able to be here. But look, they can join the online audience or watch via podcast at some other time. So an IPL is a celebration of successful promotion to our highest academic status, that of professor. At the University of Otago, we take that promotion very seriously and assess against rigorous international standards, including the use of uh, international referees, all of our uh, promotion candidates. To get promoted, one must demonstrate uh, not only outstanding performance of, at the expectation um, of internationally be benchmarked professors, but also significant leadership in areas of teaching, research and service. And in Nikki, look, we have those in spades and we're very, very pleased to be able to celebrate that. You have, we will hear more about your career from um, the Dean Shelley when she introduces you uh, and we'll get a vote of thanks from uh, the PVC and some remarks from Anita. But um, I would say as a physicist, um, we think that we like to make impact from our research and we do, but it's nothing like the impact that you and colleagues from the Children's Issues Centre and the Faculty of Law have made over 
not just years, but decades, real commitment to identifying important issues, working furiously on them with commitment and making a difference. You're the embodiment that universities are places for the creation of new knowledge through research, the dissemination through teaching and into practice and policy, and we congratulate you and the, your colleagues for that really important work that you've led. So um, I will now invite uh, Professor Shelley Griffiths to introduce you, but in doing so, can you please accept the hearty congratulations on behalf of the university for your most well-deserved uh, promotion. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're a kōshu katoa ko Shelley Griffiths toka ingoa, and as most of you know, and as Richard has alluded, I'm currently the Dean of the Faculty of Law in its 150th year, the oldest law faculty in New Zealand. And it's my great pleasure on behalf of the faculty to invite, to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture of our friend and colleague, Nikki Taylor, and to introduce her and her work to you. Nikki is currently the Director of the Children's Issue Centre. While this is Nikki's night, and we're here to celebrate her achievements and hear of her research journey. And there is nothing more boring than someone who talks about themselves rather than the person whose night it is. I do want to acknowledge that not only has Nikki been a great friend to me, that I would not actually be here but for Nikki in many ways. <laughs> Nikki and I, our friendship began when we were parents of two preschool children. And without Nikki telling me that she was working in her professional career and had two small children and was studying for a law degree, I probably never would have resumed and completed my law degree. Wow. We studied together, and like people who study together, we gossiped together and talked about <laughs> things other than the law. And the highlight for us in our law degree was the night we went on a nighttime patrol with the Dunedin police one Saturday <laughs> night. And as two youngish mothers, returning to our homes at five o'clock in the morning, it was at one point exhausting and at the other rather liberating as we recaptured our youth. We had hoped we would be in the same patrol car, but unfortunately we were separated when we got to the police station. Nikki continued with her work in the Children's Issue Centre, and completed a PhD, and I joined the faculty. And it has been a personal and professional joy for me that the Children's Issues Centre joined the faculty in 2018. Nikki was appointed to the Alexander Macmillan Leading Thinker Chair and as Director of the Children's Issues Centre in 2012. And a couple of years after finding her true home in law, she was promoted to Professor from February 2021. Nikki is an interdisciplinary scholar a socio-legal scholar, combining her training in social work and law to make a difference to the lives of children, young persons and their family through both her teaching and her research. Over her career, she's attracted significant amounts of research funding and been a prolific publisher of peer-reviewed articles and chapters and a valued contributor to many international collaborations on children's issues. Often her work has been about hearing children's voices and decisions that have been made about them so that their autonomy is recognised in a manner that is appropriate to them. She has supervised many great postgraduate students and has a reputation as a careful and caring supervisor who enables students, who often are actually busy practitioners at the same time, to achieve the very best that they are capable of. Nikki currently teaches in the law faculty the undergraduate paper in family law. There are many lawyers, in one way and another, either as students, including those who've completed in the past diplomas with the Children's Issue Centre, and practitioners who've benefited from Nikki's scholarship and her passion for the subject. She's been actively engaged with the legal profession and with the family division of the New Zealand Law Society. 
Her work and that of the centre she leads has been and continues to be significant in law reform and in the practice of family law and social work in this country and indeed internationally. Throughout her career, I know that Nikki has been supported by her husband, Mike, and her three children, Lloyd, Alex, and Victoria. All three are graduates of Otago, Lloyd and Victoria, both in law. And the second star of Nikki's IPL poster behind us is her granddaughter, Amelia. For these reasons, for all of these reasons, it's not surprising she's chosen as a topic in the title for her inaugural professorial lecture, Family Law Matters, which the more you think about it, has lots and lots of meaning, and I'm sure that's what Nikki is about to explore with us now. Please welcome Professor Nicola Taylor to deliver her inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Warm greetings to you all and thank you for being present here today. Professor Blakey, Professor Palmer, Professor Griffiths, former Chancellor Dr Royden Somerville KC, Anita Chan KC, research cluster members, colleagues of mine from the Faculty of Law, local family law practitioners, colleagues, friends and students. Thank you all for coming and a very warm welcome also to those watching online. No mai, hairi mai, welcome. Well as Shelley has indicated, I was actually promoted to professor during the COVID pandemic and this IPL has been a long time in the coming um, because of the lockdowns and the alert levels that we all experienced. But one of the real great benefits of that delay has been the opportunity to present this IPL during the 150th year of the law faculty. We had a very special celebration just three weeks ago in this very lecture theatre to celebrate Otago being the oldest law school here in New Zealand. And as I say, it's incredibly special to be presenting the first IPL in that 150th year. And I guess I can also claim as a result of the weekend events in London, the first in the reign of King Charles III. <laughs> so I want to start with where my research journey began here at the University of Otago back in 1995, a very long time ago now. So I was appointed um, to work with Professor Anne Smith, the inaugural director of the Children's Issues Centre, and it's lovely to see John her husband, and Catherine, her daughter, here in the audience tonight. We um, were tasked with developing a brand new interdisciplinary centre on children's issues to do with development rights and wellbeing for New Zealand. There's no other centre like it in the country, and indeed really um, in much of the southern hemisphere. So after a very daunting interview over in the clock tower presided over by the Vice-Chancellor at the time, Dr Graham Fogelberg, and with community and university representatives, I was delighted when Anne rang that afternoon to say, guess what, you've got the job. And this is the opening of the centre on the 20th of July. At that stage we were based at 117 Albany Street by Works and Services opposite the Eureka Cafe. And um, as you can see here, the centre was opened by the Governor-General at the time, Dame Kath Tizard, Graham Fogelberg watching on closely, Pat Seymour, who was chairperson of the Children's Issue Centre Trust, which had raised a great deal of the money to help fund the centre in partnership with the university, and of course the wonderful Anne Smith um, looking on with great delight at the final opening of her dream. So, we um, were joined at that time also by Rachel Brinsden, who I'm pleased to say is also here in the audience. So there were three staff. We were funded for the first three years by the Children's Issue Centre Trust and the university provided the premises and office equipment and computers, etc. And so the three of us, after the excitement of the opening with the Governor-General, um, had to sit down with basically a blank page and work out what is it we're actually going to do. 
Of course we wanted to bring in external research money and grow and sustain the centre, and we did that fairly quickly. Um, but we also had to think about what was it we were really going to focus on. And Anne and I decided that we would focus on our respective strengths. So Anne was a developmental psychologist, expert in early childhood education and the quality thereof. And of course I had the family law background. So we were a great combination. Anne was a phenomenal mentor and a great inspiration to many of us here in this room tonight. So we got underway and took, as has already been mentioned tonight, very seriously this idea of listening to what children themselves had to say about their own experiences um, in their daily lives. And obviously for me, a lot of that has been in relation to family law proceedings, which I'll talk more about tonight. Um, this was a visit by the Otago University Child Care Centre, and I've only really included this slide because obviously we weren't talking to children this young. <laughs> But, as Shelley has mentioned, um, we bonded <laughs> over um, our two youngest children, Victoria and Timothy, and they are both proudly sitting in the pram. <laughs> so they came on that visit. And you can see the centre, um, we were joined then by Dr Michael Gaffney, who's now currently at the College of Education, and took very seriously this idea of thinking about, um, which was novel at the time actually, nobody else was really doing this in New Zealand, what do children themselves have to say about important matters and issues that happen within their family? And these are just some of the books that we did in our very early years. So you get a, the message from the titles, you know, advocating for children, children's voices, children as citizens. And we were um, really capturing at the time the developments that were happening internationally around childhood studies, which was at that stage a fairly new discipline and also the ratification by New Zealand in 1993 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so we combined our sort of theoretical and rights-based understandings with a fairly sort of unique conceptual framework actually that underpinned our postgraduate teaching within the centre, but also our um, research projects because we wanted to honour children and hear what they had to say, not what other people said about what children wanted. I'd like to acknowledge at this point um, two other really important people in my research career. So firstly, Dr. Megan Gollop, who's sitting here beside Rachel, um, Deputy Director of the Centre. She joined the Centre in 1996, and obviously we've worked together, I hate to count the number of years actually, for over two decades anyway, very closely, and particularly on a lot of the family law work that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And I'd secondly just like to acknowledge Jocelyn Diedrich, or known to us all as Jossie, sister of Royden and family court judge Anna Somerville. Um, Jossie was our administrator from 2002 to 2018, so a very long period. She took over from the very capable Rachel um, and sadly passed away um, last year, so we miss her very much and are thinking how much we would have loved to have had both her and Anne here and present in the room tonight had that been possible. But um, Jossie was a very warm-hearted and embracing person that the students just loved and she had a great sense of humour that we all really enjoyed and that Meg and I still uh, reminisce about. So Meg, thank you hugely to you for the contribution you've made and hopefully you'll recognise a lot of it in what I'm about to talk about tonight. So as Shelley also mentioned, I'm kind of playing with this word matters tonight, looking at it in the sense of a noun and as a verb. And I'm gonna start the presentation, um, or this next part of the presentation, in relation to the family law matters in the sense of the sort of topics and issues that I have worked on. Um, I've had to be selective, otherwise you'd be here all night. Um, but I'm really focusing on these four, and I'm gonna work through these talking about a little bit about the legal um, framework that sits behind each area, some of the research that we've done, and as Richard alluded to, the very important policy and practice developments that have come out of much of this research, um, which have really been um, hugely rewarding in my career. So turning firstly to thinking about children's views and participation in family law contexts, well, our very first study in this regard was on access arrangements following parental separation. 
Um, it was funded by the then Foundation for Research, Science and Technology. And we had a sample of 107 children and young people from 73 families across, I think it was about seven family court districts across the country. And what we were looking at with the children, because remember this was pretty new back in the, in the 90s, um, was talking to the children themselves about what contact, or as it was called then, access they were having with their non-resident parent, and how involved they'd been in the decisions that were being made within their family um, around post-separation contact and care arrangements um, after their parents had separated. So we were keen to know well, what sort of involvement had they had and what was their satisfaction with the level of that involvement. And this slide here shows our early access arrangements research team. So Michael Gaffney there, Megan looking like a child, <laughs> um, <laughs> myself looking not much older, um, the lovely Anne, um, a young Mark Hennigan, who many of you will recognise, and Max Gold, who was a specialist report writer for the Family Court. So much of the research that I've done has actually been in interdisciplinary teams, which has been one of the joys of doing that work. And of course, what we found was that um, back in the 90s, not many children actually were asked for their views about how they wanted to split their time or share their time with each of their parents after they'd separated or divorced. Um, those who had felt heard were a lot more satisfied with the outcome, so you kind of get the drift in terms of what those um, findings were from that study. We also, around a similar time, um, were commissioned by the Department for Courts, the pre-runner of the Ministry of Justice, to look um, at the role of lawyer for child, because it was not uncommon in the 90s that when lawyers were, lawyers were appointed by the court to represent children, in family court proceedings, um, the lawyer actually never often met with the children. And so sometimes the children were completely unaware that they actually had a lawyer representing them. So we were asked um, to go and do some research with children to find out from them what their perspectives were on the lawyers that were appointed to represent them. And this is just a couple of the quotes that two of the really switched on kids um, gave us, which really epitomise the sort of issues that children tell us frequently in our research. You know, listening really hard, being able to get everything out, that sense of trust between a child and a family justice professional. She goes over it all so we know what's going on. And then I think Craig's quote is quite um, pivotal too. Lawyer for Child opens up a whole new thing for the judge. There was dad's views, mum's views, but you need a third party to bring the judge's eyes around. He needs a third party in the middle to be me. So a really good understanding of what the role of lawyer for child is. And um, really important to hear what children themselves said about the experience of being represented by a lawyer. It wasn't all rosy, but a lot of it was. The other area that um, a few years down the track that I did research on was uh, Professor John Caldwell from Canterbury University Law School and I interviewed all 53 at the time New Zealand family court judges around the country to ascertain their perspectives and experience on meeting with children um, because it had been really promoted within New Zealand that it was a good idea for judges to be meeting with, the, with children if children wanted to take up that opportunity. Um, it's not so in every country, Australia for example, very rarely do it, but here in New Zealand it's become very common practice. And actually um, Anna Somerville, who I mentioned earlier, um, was a real gun at doing these meetings with children as young as four years of age in the Tauranga Family Court. So here's a couple of quotes from judges that I think really help to show the benefit of children's participation in proceedings if they indeed want to do that. Um, putting that personal face, the judge gets an understanding of who the child is, it's not just um, words on affidavits and um, oral evidence in court, it's actually understanding who that child is as a person. And also that the children actually surprisingly come up with some amazingly, as he says, cracking phrases of information, which um, the parents who are in dispute with each other have been completely unable to do. So sometimes the judges actually find that the child is the one that puts forward a way, a way through the dispute that they're experiencing. And Judge 45 says, I've really felt it's a benefit. 
And then the other judge, if you're able to make decisions that will perhaps change the life direction of a child and have the confidence to do that, which of course judges are doing all the time, why not have the confidence to communicate with the person whose life you are changing? So these sorts of studies that we were doing, the ACCESS study, Lawyer for Child, judges' perspectives on meeting with children and other studies too, have actually had a really profound influence on the law policy and practice um, here within New Zealand, but also, I'm happy to say, internationally. And there's really two things that have fallen out of this. To summarise it, children's desire to have their views ascertained and heard. Most children do want to have a say. They don't want to make the decision. So we talk about this as a voice, not a choice. Um, but the other really salient issue that I think has come out of our research is the really important role of family justice professionals, like lawyers for children, like judges, in facilitating and scaffolding children's understanding of their family situation and the issues that are in dispute and the potential ways forward from that for them. So just some of the highlights of areas where we have had an influence on the law, I'm not saying we were the whole influence, but we were certainly part of it, was the widening of the requirement for children to express their views in Section 6 of the Care of Children Act, modernising the role of lawyer for child, um, so that lawyers for children must now meet with the child they're appointed to represent, unless there's exceptional circumstances, and that's reflected in the Care of Children Act, um, in the Family Courts Act, but also in the practice notes issued by the principal family court judge. And then as a result of the work that I did uh, with family court judges directly, um, I was invited by the principal family court judge to write the chapter in the family court bench book on how best for judges to be undertaking those meetings with children. So it's really great to see that translation from research through to policy and ultimately through to practice. In terms of international developments, um, partly enthused by Professor Nicola Peart's paper on comparative law when I was doing my LLB degree here at Otago, um, I was really delighted to get my first taste of international comparative research myself in 2009 through a children in the law study group that I co-led, um, which actually had the benefit of resulting in a meeting at Charles University in Prague, so that wasn't too bad. Um, so that was really a great um, way of getting to start to understand how other countries approach children's views and participation. And happily, New Zealand sits pretty much at the forefront in that area. So we're often looked to uh, in relation to our law and our practice here um, by other countries. This international handbook that you can see pictured there um, covers 17 jurisdictions and was written with colleagues from London and the Netherlands, and just published a couple of years ago. And then more recently, I've been happy to be involved in a project with Roskilde University in Denmark, uh, where I'm an international consultant on their project, working with the courts and profession over there to look at how to enhance child involvement in Danish family law proceedings. So there's some amazing developments that occur um, as a result of that. Stepping slightly outside of the law, I just want to mention this ethical research involving children, or ERIC as we call it um, for short, because this was another Child Watch International project which Professor Anne Graham from the Centre for Children and Young People in Australia and I co-led, um, because we recognised that one of the issues of doing research properly with children was actually understanding the many ethical issues that underpin that. So things like consent, confidentiality, um, safety, those sorts of issues. And we recognised there was a gap internationally um, in terms of guidance for ethical review boards, um, researchers, postgraduate students, um, other students undertaking research involving children. And we produced this uh, ERIC compendium um, but more importantly, the childethics.com website, which is now available happily in seven languages and has thousands of hits per month. So another really project that's been really close to my heart in terms of being able to you know, assist people undertaking research with children, given that we'd promoted it so heavily at the centre, um, to actually have the tools 
both research and ethically to do that. And, you know, for example, this is a document that um, our own Human Ethics Committee here at the University of Otago are very good at promoting um, when applications come to them that involve research with children. It's not just family justice professionals that um, we've been working with to try and encourage children's voices and participation. Um, happily, in the study that we did uh, looking at parenting after separation, it was part of a, a bigger study looking at the effect of the 2014 family law reforms that were introduced. Um, but it involved, as you can see, some pretty large numbers of people. So we had one, one phase which was looking um, at separated parents with an online survey, and then we interviewed 191 of them. And we were interested in looking at what the steps were that they took to make or change the parenting arrangements since those 2014 reforms had come into being, because they did change the pathways within the court um, somewhat significantly uh, as a result of efforts to try and reduce the cost of the courts to the country um, and to put more onus on parents reaching their own resolution through um, family dispute resolution mediation. And I've just got to note there that um, you know, 67% of those separated parents that we had involved in this study described their relationship with their former partner as poor or very poor. So like, we're not just talking about amiable, happy, cooperative, separated parents. We're talking about you know, families where there's all sorts of conflict, dispute, hostility, and at times violence. We also, in that study, uh, did a survey and interviews with a lot of family justice professionals too. But in terms of what I'm going to present here, I'm really just talking about the parent data. So the 417 separated parents who did the survey and that you know, we interviewed a number of them, um, we asked them to tell us what the steps were that they took to resolve those parenting arrangements post-separation. There was a possible 33 steps that they, could that they could select from. And having selected the steps that they used, we then asked them to rank the top three steps that were most helpful to them. And we were really thrilled, <laughs> surprised, I don't know, me, to see that um, the most helpful step that came out of that parent data was talking with children and seeking their thoughts, feelings and views. And I've put the blue highlight there on legal advice and the family court so that those of you in the family justice community can feel somewhat basking in the glory that your advice and support is also considered helpful um, by nearly half of the families that were in our study. So it's great to think that, you know, we're not just trying to um, en encourage parents, uh, encourage, sorry, family justice professionals, like lawyers and judges to be talking with children, if, it, if that works, um, but also to see those conversations happening within the families themselves. And this was just a lovely quote from one of the mums in the study um, about wanting to hear what their children's opinions were you know, sitting down, we talked about what each of us wanted as parents, um, ex-partners, and then we sat down as a family and discussed it with the kids and gave them an opportunity to tell us how they felt. We put it to them as mum and dad have talked about it, and this is what we think would be best, but we want to hear what your opinions are. So really, you know, from a research perspective, from a human rights perspective, I don't think you can ask for a whole lot more. Um, that was a great finding. Turning to my second matter, family law matter, relationship property division. So this is much more recent work, and I'm just going to give you a bit of law to start with. So um, the general rule under the Property Relationships Act of 1976 is that each partner is entitled to share equally in relationship property, regardless of their contribution, subject to limited exceptions. So if there's extraordinary circumstances, economic disparity, or it's a relationship of short duration, then the equal sharing rule um, may not necessarily apply. And furthermore, it's possible um, in, if you're in contemplation of a relationship, or you're already in a relationship, to contract out of that PRA equal sharing regime. And I'll explain a little further how that works. So the Law Commission um, has been tasked with reviewing 
this Property Relationships Act and produced a very substantial report for the Minister of Justice in 2019, but was sadly lacking um, in the lead up to that report in any empirical data to help inform the recommendations that they subsequently wanted to make. So we were contracted um, and funded by the Boren Foundation to undertake two phases of work, the first phase of which contributed directly to that 2019 report. And that was a large representative sample study using Colmar Brunton actually did it for us, um, looking at public attitudes and values to post-separation relationship property division. And then in phase two, um, which we just completed last year, we did a survey and interviewed a whole lot of families about how separated couples actually go about dividing their property and resolving any disputes between them. So that's the research team. We've got um, now Justice Helen McQueen, um, who was at that time the Deputy President of the Law Commission, uh, myself, Mark, Megan, Ian Binney, an independent research contractor, um, and yeah, Law Commission people there. So what we found um, on that survey was that actually there was a very high awareness of the equal sharing law. 79% of the, that representative sample over the age of 18 across New Zealand knew about equal sharing. 74% agreed with it, but when we put various scenarios to them, they were very quick to depart from that concept of equal sharing in particular circumstances. And the two that I've got up there are where a person is coming into a relationship with an already mortgage-free home. They didn't believe that it was fair that the other partner, at the point of separation, got to equally share in that home. And the other scenario, of course, um, is where one partner's given up their career to stay at home and care for the couple's children. And there was a general feeling that on separation, that person needed to be kind of compensated or rewarded um, for their loss of earnings and the inability to get back into the workforce and the place that they would have been had they not stepped out of it. What was also quite alarming, I think, for Megan and I was that 80% of our sample um, talked about experiencing emotional distress, anxiety and stress while dividing their property. So I think it's really important for family justice professionals and perhaps for you know, family members, um, neighbours in the street to understand that when people are going through relationship property division disputes, um, it can be a pretty tough time and challenging for them. Lawyers were the first professional that 75% of our respondents sought out for help, advice and information, showing again the significance of the legal profession in the family law space here in New Zealand. And interestingly, when we asked them how they reached agreement over their property division, well, 48% of them did it just themselves with their former partner. 45% negotiated via professionals who were mostly lawyers, again. And only 8% end up in the courts. 71% of those who resolved their property division themselves reported their outcome was fully or partially consistent with the law of equal sharing. So again, you can see that real influence of understanding what the law provides for in these situations and how people therefore organise their agreements in response to that. Now, contracting out is another really interesting area because um, there's very strict legal rules around how a couple can contract out of that equal sharing law. So any agreement that they reach has to be in writing and signed by both parties. They each have to have independent legal advice before they sign. The signature of each party has to be witnessed by a lawyer, and that lawyer has to certify that before the parties signed the agreement, the lawyer explained the effect and implication of the agreement. Because by departing from equal sharing, one party is going to end up with significantly more and the other one will probably end up with significantly less as a result. So the law is very careful here to guard against unequal bargaining positions or oppressive agreements and that's why it insists upon this independent legal advice. 
Um, the agreement can, of course, be set aside if giving effect to it would cause serious injustice. So we were interested in our research to understand what are people's experience and knowledge of contracting out of the PRA. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found it wasn't common to have a prenuptial agreement, as they're often called. Only 7% of those in our sample had actually made an agreement that was certified by a lawyer. Now, a lot of other people in the study talked about having an agreement, but it was either verbal or um, if it was written, it had not been certified by a lawyer. So we think there's a real gap here that people possibly believe they have a valid contracting out agreement, but because it doesn't meet the requirements of the law, if they ever went to enact that um, or use it in a court case, um, it would be invalid. 72% hadn't even discussed contracting out with their partner, and the 25% who had considered it, as in they'd thought about it, less than half of them actually went ahead and discussed that contracting out possibility with their partner. And I mean, again, it's not surprising, but the reasons that they gave were, well, the relationship wasn't that serious. We didn't actually have enough property to share, so we weren't too bothered about trying to contract out of an equal sharing arrangement. And then, of course, the possible negative impact that raising a contracting out agreement might have on their relationship. And as one person put it, it might set an expectation that the relationship will fail. So probably not the smartest move in order to enter into a new relationship by trying to get a contracting out agreement. But we think it's important that this issue is given greater consideration. And one of the things that we did at the end of last year, well, it took us actually all year to write these, Meg, but um, we wrote six research highlights, again, funded by the Boren Foundation, drawing on that data we'd got from the surveys and from the interviews to try and um, write in, a, in layman's terms, using the experience of those people that took part in our study, to offer advice and guidance in the form of these six particular topics. I've just got the contracting out one there, which is number five, um, which have been widely distributed through the family law section of the Law Society, Citizens Advice Bureau and the like. So again, it's another illustration of how we're really keen to make sure that our research you know, arrives um, in the public arena and can benefit people going through these very challenging experiences. Right, turning to relocation disputes. Well, a relocation dispute arises obviously following parental separation and divorce. Um, when one parent is wanting to move away with the children, um, either within New Zealand or indeed internationally, and the dispute arises because the other parent objects to that proposed relocation, um, usually because of the significant impact it's going to have on their relationship and contact with the child, because the child will now be physically distant from them. It's an area of law where there's no rules or presumptions. Um, the welfare and best interests of the child is paramount, um, and that's in Section 4 of the Care of Children Act. Um, so basically what happens in this area is that parents and guardians, and those of you that are parents hopefully know this, is that on important matters affecting your child, like their name, their place of residence, um, non-routine medical treatment, religion, um, schooling, both parents' guardians, or all parents' guardians if there's more than two, must consult and agree on any changes to their child's place of residence and those other important matters. If a parent doesn't engage in that consultation and seeking the agreement of the other parent, and they move unilaterally without that person's consent, then if it's within New Zealand, the court can order them back, order the child back to the original location. If they move unilaterally and take the child overseas, then it becomes technically a wrongful removal under the Hay Convention on International Child Abduction and I'll talk in a minute about how that process works. So, you know, pretty serious stuff that sits at the heart of these cases. So we undertook New Zealand's first study on relocation, um, funded by the New Zealand Law Foundation. Myself, Mark Hennigan and Megan, again, were involved in this project. 
We had the strong support of the Principal Family Court Judge and the Family Law Section of the New Zealand Law Society who assisted us hugely with recruitment of families into the study. And you can see there we had 114 parents um, who we interviewed twice over a 12 to 18 month period. So Megan and I were in rental cars all over New Zealand, zooming around, uh, meeting with these families. And it was well worth going back that second time about a year later because you know they had got to know us by then and we got a lot more data actually on the second visit. And um, Megan, for the most part, interviewed 44 children from 30 of those um, families as well. So what that study did was contributed hugely to the quest for international consistency. There was this really strong desire internationally to have a more consistent approach to relocation disputes because different jurisdictions deal with these cases quite differently. And I've just given a couple of examples here. So in England and in Wales, relocations, usually, I mean, mostly these applications are brought by mums, um, were mostly allowed. And this was a famous case of pain and pain, where um, Lord Justice Thorpe in the English Court of Appeal said that the effect on the mother's future psychological and emotional stability was of concern to the court if the application to relocate was refused. So the idea was that you allowed the mother to shift with the children, particularly if she was the primary parent, and the sort of happy mother, happy child kind of scenario would play out because mum would be able to then be the best parent she could be to the children in that new location. So many um, dads in England and Wales didn't in this period even bother bringing applications to the court because they knew that she would be allowed to go with the kids. Conversely, here in New Zealand, we've had a much more 50-50 approach um, and a much more individualised approach, which of course is, is consistent with our Care of Children Act requirements, but um, much greater emphasis here on the idea of keeping both parents involved in their children's lives, ideally um, post-separation. So much more difficult to be able to argue a successful relocation case here because of the impact that that um, shift would have on the left behind parents' relationship with their children. So we just struck it lucky in terms of timing with our study. Um, I was invited in 2009, this is Lord Justice Thorpe here with the fancy wig, um, to a, a, a Commonwealth and Common Law Jurisdiction Conference that he was putting together in Windsor, um, in Cumberland Lodge in the Windsor Great Park, and um, presented the New Zealand research evidence. And uh, as a result of that presentation, I was then tapped on the shoulder and asked to pair up with Professor Marilyn Freeman from London to write a paper reviewing all the research evidence on international family mobility for the next um, cross-border family relocation judicial conference that was being held in Washington DC the following year. And that was really where my partnership with Marilyn, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute, um, started to develop. Um, we've done very similar research in terms of relocation and we work now very closely together on abduction matters. But it was just a, a wonderful opportunity um, to be paired with a person from the Northern Hemisphere um, to work on an issue of great common interest to us, but also to see it play out in that cross-jurisdictional um, judicial arena in both Windsor and in Washington. So just turning to my last family law matter, international child abduction. So here we have a Hague Convention that governs this area, uh, an international treaty. It currently has 103 contracting states around the world, and New Zealand became a contracting state back in 1991, so we're a fairly long-standing member of this Hague Convention, and it sits now as part of our Care of Children Act 2004. A quite different approach is adopted in relation to abduction matters. So unlike relocation where it's the welfare and best interest of the child that's important, here it's a quite different scenario. 
So basically the convention applies when a child is either wrongfully removed from one country to another or indeed retained in another country, perhaps while they're on holiday and not returned back to their um, state of habitual residence with uh, where they've been living up to date. And that retention or removal has to be in breach of the other parent's rights of custody. So if this indeed happens, then the left behind parent can apply through the essential authority for the child to be returned to their country of habitual residence, i.e. brought back to where they're living. And the whole premise behind this Hague Convention is that it's the courts in that country who then address the care and contact and welfare matters in dispute between the parents. So it's really um, focused around summary proceedings, the rapid location of the child, because sometimes these kids are hidden and can be difficult to find, um, but having found them, um, for there to be these summary quick proceedings and the speedy return of the child back to the other country where the courts can then work out those larger welfare, care and contact matters. So it's the forum or the jurisdiction, not the child's welfare, that's really at play here, unless one of the very limited convention exceptions applies. And this is where Marilyn and I have been um, applying our knowledge and expertise um, in recent years. So two of those exceptions to return, the first is that the abducted child, him or herself, objects to being returned back to the country of origin. And we had a British Academy grant in 2018 to conduct an online international survey of family justice professionals to try and get a handle on what different jurisdictions were doing in respect of this particular exception. And then we also interviewed a whole range of family justice professionals, um, abducted children, taking parents and left behind parents. The second exception, um, is this one of grave risk, and this is becoming really critically important now with our unfortunate growth in domestic violence um, within family situations post-separation. So basically what this exception says is that if there's a grave risk that the child's return back to that state of habitual residence would expose a child to physical or psychological harm or otherwise place the child in an intolerable situation, then that can be a ground for the judge to exercise their discretion and not order the child to be returned. It's um, a very high standard to reach because of this idea of summary proceedings and quick, rapid return of the child, ideally. But it's becoming um, critical because what's now happening, it's a very frequently argued exception, because women in particular are fleeing domestic violence situations um, in their home country and taking their children with them, often returning to their homeland but possibly to a whole new country to try and secure both their and their children's safety and protection. And so it becomes critical for the convention in these situations to really start considering from a policy perspective whether it's appropriate to have a, you know, to have, a, have the focus of this area of law being on speedy return when that may be posing danger um, and risk to the child, in particular if they are returned back to their homeland. So we've got a current um, international survey operating online at the moment internationally to try and get an understanding of what family justice professionals around the world are having to say in relation to the arguing of this exception, whether they're noticing any growth in the a number of times it's being argued, and the sort of policy considerations that are of concern in their country in relation to it. Other projects that I'm um, involved in, um, Meg and I are currently analysing 10 years worth of data from our Ministry of Justice here in New Zealand. One of the big conundrums internationally in this whole area under the Hague Convention is actually not knowing what happens on return for those children. There's very little research evidence in relation to whether or not those anticipated court proceedings do in fact occur. And fortunately for us, um, our central authority here in the Ministry of Justice in Wellington 
has been collecting child return data. So these are children who have been abducted from New Zealand to another country and have been either ordered to return back to New Zealand or there's been a parental consent agreement reached that they do return. And uh, we are in thick in the middle, aren't we, Meg, of analysing and coding that data. And it's really going to be the first data internationally that is going to give us some perspective on what happens for these children by way of further court proceedings on their return to their state of habitual residence. Uh, in October this year, I'm going to be in London. Um, I've been appointed as rapporteur for an experts meeting, which is going to be looking at issues to do with asylum, domestic violence, and child participation in relation to abduction proceedings. And Marilyn and I have got a couple of books coming out, um, one very shortly, actually the first one, a Research Handbook on International Child Abduction, and uh, next year, one looking at this issue of young children and young people's identities um, in international law, and part of that book will include the identity issues in relation to abducted children. Late last year, we uh, launched this website um, called Finding Home, the name of which was given to it by a group of children and young people that we had working in an advisory group with the research team to try and get some information available on the internet for, not just for abducted children, but also for children generally to get a better understanding about what abduction is what the law says about it, you know, how the Hague Convention works, how our domestic statutes work. We've used case studies um, written specially for children, and importantly, have got a whole section on it in relation to where they can go for information and support. So this is really part of this sort of area of work that I've got a strong interest in around children's own access to justice and their legal literacy. And at the moment, the website's only available in English, but the French and Spanish translations have just been completed and will be uploaded, um, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. So we anticipate, hopefully, that, that uh, the languages will expand, um, because that then makes, of course, the accessibility to children in many other jurisdictions much more easy. And finally, the special commissions. So. Every five or six years, the Permanent Bureau at The Hague coordinate a special commission on the 1980 Hague Convention, and they bring delegations from each of the contracting states to um, the Peace Palace in The Hague. So this is um, me back in 2017. Um, I was fortunate enough to be a, given observer status at the 2017 special commission. And I've been given the same status again at the 8th Special Commission that's going to be held in October this year. So it's a great opportunity for the contracting states to look at operational issues. So those couple that I mentioned around the child subjection exception and around grave risk will be firmly on the agenda at the 2023 Commission. Um, and from a research perspective, it's a great opportunity to be engaging with lawyers judges, um, other NGOs and academics who all have a really strong and vested interest in doing better in the international child abduction space. So it's a, a great place to visit if you're ever in The Hague. So turning to the last part of my presentation tonight, I want to look now at matters from another perspective. Why does family law matter? And I'm going to start with uh, the 1976 report of the Royal Commission on the Courts, which was the body that was tasked um, back in the 70s with looking at the structure and operation of our court structure here in New Zealand. And many of their recommendations related to the need to introduce a family court in New Zealand, um, rather than having the Supreme Court and Magistrates Court at the time um, hearing applications in relation to family matters. Now the Royal Commission um, made a couple of remarks which my students will recognise. Um, work in family law has an extra dimension and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But I think it's really important to realise that you're not just dealing with the law here, you're dealing with very human situations. And that extra dimension is something I drill into my students every year and I expect to see in their um, exam 
uh, scripts that they are not just telling me the law, but they're, they're showing me how they're responding to the clients and the scenarios in a humane, sensitive and caring fashion. And the Royal Commission also said that family courts have a twofold function, judicial and therapeutic. And hopefully what I've shown you tonight with some of my research is how we're trying to balance that at the centre and in the faculty um, to try and ensure that students are coming out well-rounded and fully equipped practitioners because, as you've seen, the role of lawyers in society, and family law in particular, is very much uh, welcomed by family members and embraced by them when they are in dispute with each other. So our family court was established here in 1981 directly as a result of these recommendations from that Royal Commission. One of the reasons why I think family law really matters is its massive spread of cradle to the grave is often talked about. Now you'll see there on my first couple of lines that I actually argue it's actually before the cradle and it's actually after the grave because family law now applies um, before birth. So if you think about assisted human reproductive technologies and surrogacy sort of issues, um, and it certainly applies after death because the will that you have left may well be challenged by your loved ones and you're not around to have anything to, to do about that. Um, many of the disputes are between adult to adult, um, parents and guardians, over things like entering and leaving relationships, um, over their children, and I've given some examples of that with relocation um, and the contact arrangements and abduction. Well, the other really important area of family law is state intervention in relation to family violence, to protecting children, um, to out-of-home care, and of course in the youth justice space. So a massive breadth of issues that the law is grappling to deal with. And what's really critical here is I've called it high stakes because these are profoundly personal issues. These are about your partners, your spouses, possibly your former partners or spouses critically significant if they're about your children because you know the most profoundly important people in your life you're suddenly in dispute with your ex-partner over and um, there needs to be a lot of sensitivity and a responsive legal framework in order to ensure that further damage is not done um, to that family relationship scenario. I think it's also important to recognise that family law, and we don't necessarily do this terribly well in many areas, but recognising other family and whānau relationships, and I particularly want to mention grandparents, because particularly in the out-of-home care space, um, often it's grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, um, and there's often only limited opportunities for them to be able to have a stake in family law proceedings because of the way our law currently being structured often around fairly nuclear-based family scenarios. If you're not um, in dispute over the important people in your life, you're likely to be in dispute over your property and your financial security, which, as I showed with that PRA study, um, you know, is incredibly important to people that you've got that sense of financial security going forward and that the property that you've built up together is shared equally between you. At times too, it can be safety and protection, high stakes areas in relation to your own personal vulnerability and indeed safety and at times your life or your children's lives. And that sense of autonomy, self-esteem and feeling heard that many of us of course want to have in our lives. Family law also runs the gamut of human emotion. So you know, we've got everything in family law from great joy and huge excitement through to distress, fear and trauma, uncertainty, anger at times, grief, loss and heartbreak, bewilderment and pragmatism, making a will, contracting out of the PRA, appointing an enduring power of attorney, all very straightforward things that you need to think about and be doing um, in order to have some security as you age. Bargaining in the shadow of the law, this is a concept that's been around since 1979, 
Um, it's not just unique to family law, but it's this idea that people essentially settle matters themselves in a way that takes into account what would happen if the matter indeed went to court. And obviously people, when they're bargaining in the shadow of the law, are very influenced by their own knowledge and understanding of the law. And that's why I think our centre has put so much emphasis on helping people to get a better understanding and knowledge of the law that might be pertinent to them in relation to family matters. And as I showed with my PRA research findings, um, there's high awareness, for example, of the equal sharing law. And people divide their property often with just their former partner. They're not necessarily going to lawyers and the courts. But 71% of them who did do that reported that their property division was fully or partially consistent with the law of equal sharing. So clearly they're bargaining in the shadow of that PRA law and what they would get had they gone to court. So I think it's a really important concept to be thinking about in a way of improving people's um, legal literacy by improving their understanding of different aspects of the law relating to relationships and to children, for example. Rules and discretion is another really important area. Um, family law began heavily influenced by its ecclesiastical and church beginnings. So a lot of very um, moral thinking um, about what was right and wrong in family life. And huge weight put on the supremacy, this is back in the 1800s, of fathers' rights in respect of their legitimate children up until the age of 21. Gradually we began to see that erode as the welfare of the child principle started to take effect. So in 1887 was when it first came into our law here in New Zealand, and in 1926 it was elevated to become the first and paramount consideration, which is what it remains today. However, despite that sort of softening of the rules, um, we still had a lot of presumptions operating in family law. So I'm just going to use one example, tender years. The idea that children under the age of seven benefited from being in the nurturing, loving care of their mother, and boys at the age of seven would then transfer to the custody of their father in order to get his masculine influence. So even though we had this welfare and best interest of the child, the courts were still pretty much operating on this idea of following these sort of um, rules or principles that had, had grown up over time. But we get to the beginning of the 20th century and we get the start of the discipline of psychology, which has enormous influence and still does actually, because suddenly this concept of children's attachments became important. Which parent or how are children attached to each of their parents? And um, that really started to give judges a lot more scope in relation to how they might be determining the outcome of disputes between parents and guardians, because they weren't bound by rules, they now had to implement the welfare and best interests of the child, they had psychological expert evidence to do that, and indeed our, our um, Section 4 of the Care of Children Act talks about a child in his or her particular circumstances. So back to that very individualised approach um, that I mentioned in relation to relocation. But I just want to make the point that rules do remain important in some areas. So equal sharing, um, international child abduction, a rule of return, um, and in the child support area. But there's always caveats um, and exceptions out of that if there's going to be an unjust or an unsafe outcome resulting. Finally, um, reflecting social change. I think family law, at times we struggle to keep up with the pace of social change. But we've certainly moved hugely, when you think over the last couple of centuries, away from marriage being the important parental status, um, children's legitimacy. It was 1969 when um, we got rid of illegitimacy from our law and the notion of father's supreme rights. So there's a constant tension with trying to respond to evolving demographic and social trends. And I'll just put a couple of examples there. Um, in 2005, we introduced civil unions, and in 2013, same-sex marriage. So you can see the shift in responsiveness to the different types of relationships that are now occurring in New Zealand. 
Challenging circumstances make it very difficult for the court because you know, separation, violence, poverty, mental health issues, um, substance use, particularly meth, um, is leading to more frequent and complex engagement. And I just want to note here too the importance of the impact of colonisation and the inequities that have occurred for Māori in the family law space because you know, children under the age, Māori children under the age of um, 18 account for 25% of our population, but there's 68% of the children in out-of-home state care. So we've got a long way to go. Um, the Oranga Tamariki Act has made great strides in trying to recognise the importance of cultural connectedness and tikanga, um, but I think uh, other family law statutes would benefit from some close scrutiny in those regards as well. And then, of course, our international law obligations, the UN conventions, the Hague conventions that we're party to are really important that we're reflecting um, in our law. So, I want to thank my parents, Colleen and Forbes Taylor. Um, grew up on a farm at a place called Windwhistle in the Rakaia Gorge, a very small country school, and um, they were always incredibly supportive of the importance of education in, the, in my, my and my brother's life. My husband, Mike, been mentioned already, um, running here the Queenstown Marathon and then just completing with my two children the coast to coast earlier this year. Been a great support. My three children, uh, Lloyd, Alex and Victoria, um, all proud graduates of this university, and Royden, and I thought you might like that photo, <laughs> capping my daughter Victoria with her law degree about five years ago. Um, and as Shelley has mentioned, my son Lloyd, also a law graduate from this faculty. My granddaughter, um, the baby that you see, we saw on the original um, IPL photograph, her mum Hannah, um, so Amelia is now two years old, and a great source of delight in my life. I'd also like to thank my research funders. Uh, Richard alluded to the fact that I have had a lot of grants over the years, and I've always been incredibly grateful, um, particularly to the New Zealand Law Foundation and the Michael and Suzanne Boren Foundation, who have given me, or well, given the centre, numerous grants. I'd also like to particularly note the Alexander Macmillan Trust, because it was their generous donation matched by government funding that created the leading thinker chair that I'm privileged to um, occupy, and that's managed capably through the Otago University Foundation Trust. And having the freedom to have that income has really benefited my research career hugely, and I'm enormously grateful to the Alexander Macmillan Trust for making that possible. I also wish to pay tribute to the research colleagues and of you know, the participants in my studies. Um, as you've seen, I've done a lot of interdisciplinary and socio-legal research, often in teams, with, with uh, key advisors from the profession. And that's been a really great way of getting a much more rounded and balanced view, I think, of the issues that are at play in family law matters. My students, um, PhDs, LLMs, MBHLs, MAs, postgraduate diploma in child-centred practice and postgraduate certificate in children's issues have been a great source of joy to me over many years. Um, I think it was Shelley that mentioned that many of them are actually very experienced and senior practitioners in the family justice field in New Zealand. And if I can encourage any of you more in the audience tonight to come and do a PhD, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but, you know, it's a great way that they've been able to take that scholarship back into their practice um, and you know, really do some great work because they've got such a wealth of experience behind them at the point that they come to us here at the university. Uh, my family law students, um, 180 of them this year, who are a great delight to teach. And I just also want to note um, Anita Chen, KC here. Um, Anita has been a great friend of the family law program here at Otago, not just in my time, but in um, Mark Hennigan's time as well and she's actually our guest speaker at Thursday's lecture. <laughs> so thank you, Anita, for all that you bring to the class as well. And then just the family justice professionals, the oh, must be thousands of parents, caregivers, family and whanau members, children and young people that Megan and I have talked to over a couple of decades. Um, honestly, our research would not be where it is if it wasn't for their generosity in 
contributing and answering our deep and meaningful questions when we um, either do it online or come and see them in the sanctity of their homes. I just want to conclude tonight um, in the 150th year of the faculty by noting our history in family law here in the faculty. Um, prior to the 1960s, family law, as I understand it, was primarily taught in relation to other subjects, um, so it wasn't a standalone paper uh, on its own. But from the 1960s and 70s, we had people like Alan Holden, Sir Bruce Robertson, who many of you will know, he was here at the reunion um, three weeks ago. And just to note too that Bruce was the first independent uh, chair of the Children's Issues Centre Advisory Board. So we've had a very long-standing relationship with then Justice Bruce Robertson, now Sir Bruce Robertson, um, and he retains a strong interest in the centre as indeed he does in the faculty. And then Ian Muir, um, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago uh, in London. And then we hit um, that very lengthy, nearly 40-year era of Professor Mark Hennigan, um, who I think really put family law at Otago on the map. Um, it's a very popular subject at Otago, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with Mark's refreshing and enthusiastic approach to all things family law. So I would just like to say how very proud I am to add my name to that list of eminent people and to be the current uh, family law professor at the University of Otago. So, na mahi nui, thank you very much, and I'll leave you with this to reflect on. Thank you. O oh, tēnā tātou katoa, uh, ko Jessica Palmer tōku wenga, ko te manakura o te kite aranui o, o tākou whakaihuaka tēnei. Um, it's normally my great pleasure as, as the PVC of the division in which the Faculty of Law uh, sits to give a vote of thanks and a few comments, but I have the great pleasure tonight of passing that over to Anita Chan Casey, who's already been introduced, so I won't spend a long time um, introducing her, but just to say, um, to thank you to you, Anita, for the friend that you are to the faculty and for the great support you are to us, and particularly to Nikki. Um, just to let you know, we are a little bit um, a little behind time, so just to give you a, a sense of what's coming. She's gonna speak for about four or five minutes, and then I'm gonna get back up, present Nikki with a gift, and give her a final thanks, and then invite all of you to join us for a refreshments at the staff club. So hold on, we're almost there. And it's well worth it, right? <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to acknowledge on behalf of the Family Law Bar the enormous contribution that Professor Nikki Taylor has made to the development of family law here in Aotearoa and also internationally. Nikki is so modest that it has taken me until tonight <laughs> to properly appreciate the breadth and depth of the work that she has um, done. Um, it's left me quite envious, um, hearing her lecture tonight, it's left me quite envious of all of the international travel that she has been forced to undertake. <laughs> I've um, been very excited about tonight's, about Nikki's IPL tonight, and took the opportunity to colour coordinate um, my outfit with hers in honour of her address. As you heard from Nikki, historically, family law was driven by the application of rules which we now consider to be crude and archaic. At the time this law faculty was established in 1959, family law did not exist as a distinct subject in the law degree. Divorce at that time would only be granted upon proof of wrongdoing, such as desertion, habitual drunkenness, imprisonment of more than five years for violence against a child of the marriage, and non-compliance with an order requiring the restitution of conjugal rights. What a long way we've come. 
As Nikki has explained, far greater recognition is now given by the law to the special dynamics that exist in family relationships. One of the most significant advances in modern family law um, has been, as Nikki has explained, the statutory recognition that the welfare and best interests of the child is the first and paramount consideration. The best interests of the child, children's rights, have been at the heart of Nikki's work. Nikki's contribution to this area of the law is magnified by the fact that not only is she a first-class legal academic, but she is also an internationally recognised researcher on family law issues. It is due in no small part to Nikki's work and to the work of the colleagues that she has mentioned, that lawmakers and all professionals involved in the dis dispensation of family justice are able to draw upon a rich resource of research on the effects on children of particular family justice processes. It is because of Nikki's research that we know, for instance, that children from separated families don't just want to have a voice, they want to participate authentically in decisions on matters affecting them. More than that, there are intrinsic benefits for the children and their families um, of them participating authentically. Authentic child participation, as Nikki found in her studies, requires adults, including family justice professionals, to have the ability to engage effectively with children, provide information, aid understanding of the family situation and or their parents' dispute, scaffold the expression of their views, and explain the implications of the decision ultimately made. In my own experience as a lawyer acting for children, I have found children to be articulate and insightful commentators on their lives. Almost all of the children I've represented appreciate that having a voice does not, is not the same as having a choice. As a family law profession, we are indebted to Nikki for the work that she has done and continues to do in championing the rights of children in the family justice system. Please, Nikki, please accept our warmest and most enthusiastic congratulations on this auspicious occasion. So let me just find my bag of goodies. Um, so, ahorangi Nikki Taylor, um, whaka mihi kia koe. Uh, nā mihi nui mō ta mahi, mō ta, uh, ta whaikorero tine pō. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for the way in which your work has impact um, in so many circles and spheres and in a way that really matters to us as New Zealanders. What you are doing makes us better and that is truly what we as humanity scholars believe we're called to do and be and you have embodied that so well in your research. So bravo, thank you. Thank you for choosing Otago and for staying with us and we hope to um, benefit from your research for as many years to come and your name on that list at the end is rightly deserving to be there. So congratulations. Thank you.